Alright, welcome back to Western Hunting Gateways. This is going to be the first episode in a new series where I'm going to focus on mule deer diets across different eco-regions of the West. And I wanted to take the channel in a different direction and away from the focusing on just tag drawing statistics and maybe reviewing hunting equipment. Because I feel like the the online YouTube hunting sort of space is filled with that kind of content already. So for this first episode, I'm actually going to focus on mule deer diets in northwest Colorado because I feel like that's a popular enough area that enough people would have an interest in mule deer diets specifically for this area where they would want some of this information. So the area that I'm specifically going to be looking at would be referred to as, I don't know how to pronounce this exactly, but I'm going to call it the Piscience Basin area of northwest Colorado. If you hunt areas like 21, 22, 23, 41, 42, 43, 52, 53, 54, 421, and 521, this would be your sort of area. A lot of people are familiar with Grand Junction and especially Gunnison as um, top hunting areas around western Colorado. So that's, again, why I picked this area, because I feel like there would be a high enough demand for information on mule deer diets in that region. Just a little background on the, the climatology of that region. Around November 1st, so kind of that period in the middle of a lot of the hunting seasons, the average daily highs can get up to 59 degrees Fahrenheit, and the average lows are sitting around freezing at that time. Precipitation in this area is relatively low, somewhere in the 10 to 20 inches of annual precipitation range, and that's going to vary greatly based on how high on those slopes you are. Higher up on the slopes at higher elevations, it's going to be closer to those 20 inches, whereas lower in the basins, it's going to be closer to those 10 inches. Alright, so what I'm going to be looking at specifically today is the plant community and what plants within that community mule deer are utilizing as forage during a lot of the hunting seasons. So this plant community is actually going to be pretty familiar to a lot of people that know western ecosystems and western plant communities. This is going to be sagebrush and juniper type ecosystems. But within that ecosystem there's going to be specific plants that mule deer focus on more. So for in background information for today's episode, I pulled three sources where researchers and scientists studied the diets of mule deer within this particular basin area and recorded what they were feeding on. I have a study from one winter that was a particularly harsh winter, a uh, fall period that was particularly average, and then I have a study that was taken from June time frame and based on stomach contents. So out of these three studies, Wyoming Big Sagebrush showed up twice. Yellow rabbit brush is featured in their diets, but it's not a major component, uh, along with broom snakeweed, kind of in the same situation where it's not a major component. Mountain mahogany featured as a major component one time. Antelope bitter brush featured as a major component another time. Utah service berry was a major component in two out of those three studies. Gamble oak was in one of them. Pinion pine and Utah juniper were also in two of those studies. The interesting caveat with the pinion pine and the Utah juniper is that they featured as major components in especially in that study that was done during a particularly harsh winter and the authors of that study also noted specifically that that might be because the particularly harsh winter climate at that time forced mule deer away from using stuff like antelope bitter brush and service berry and had them focusing more on the pinion pine and the utah juniper just because they're evergreen and they were staying palatable and ex um since they're higher up on the tree they're not exposed in the or exposed and not embedded within the snow so they were available for forage. I'm not going to talk about Wyoming Big Sagebrush a ton today. I'm going to try and do an episode probably it's going to end up being on the Great Basin or the Red Desert probably in Wyoming and I'm going to really get into hopefully really get into sagebrush and talk about which strains are more palatable than others because there's a lot of different subspecies variation within that big sagebrush and palatability does vary across those subspecies. So the first major plant that I'm going to talk about today is mountain mahogany. And going back, this one was featured in one of the studies as a major food item. So mountain mahogany is noted if you go onto the USDA plants database site as a high palatab palatability item for browsing animals. So they have at their bottom of the description for each plant that have the palatability raising rating for both grazing and browsing animals, and it's rated as high for browsing animals. It's a member of the rose family, and you're going to notice that that's going to be a very common theme today. Everything that we're going to talk about is coincidentally in the rose family, and a lot of actually the browse that we see out west that mule deer are utilizing is within the rose family. If it's not within the chinopod family or the 
Asteraceae family with sagebrush, but everything today is going to be in the rose family. This is interesting because it's sometimes an evergreen plant. In certain areas where it's particularly cold, it will drop its leaves, but in more arid climates, pushing into northern New Mexico, northern Arizona, it can actually be evergreen. Overall, the this tree, you would call it a tree, maybe you could argue that it's a shrub, but it's probably more appropriately categorized as a tree, is up to 12 feet tall with 2 inch leaves. So there's two types of mountain mahogany, and the one I'm talking about today is the regular mountain mahogany, and, or it's, it can be called um, the alder mountain mahogany. I believe it's the alder mountain mahogany. The other one is curl leaf mountain mahogany, and the leaves on that one look like canoes versus this more um, serrated and circular shaped leaves on this regular mountain mahogany. So that would be the way to tell this. It's a stunted, shrubby looking tree that gets up to 12 feet tall with leaves that are about two inches long that look like this jagged on the, the sides and have the strong veins running along the surface of those leaves. Second plant I'm going to talk about today, and this one is probably going to feature a lot in all of the mule deer diets throughout the West, but this is antelope bitterbrush. Again, this is rated as palatability for the browse animal as high. It's also in the rose family. This one is completely evergreen across most of its range, and that helps it be a crucial browse component of any mule deer diet across the, the seasons, especially in fall and winter when other browse species have lost their leaves. This is a, about a three foot tall shrub with three quarter inch leaves on average. It looks a lot like sagebrush, the, the type of leaves with that tripart, trident sort of shape, but these are a darker shade of green and if you crush up the leaves, they don't have the same kind of odor, that strong sagey odor that sagebrush has. So this is largely an odorless leaf, and that's that darker shade of green. And if, it, if you get the chance to see it flowering, which you probably wouldn't during most of the hunting seasons, it has these very distinct yellow flowers. But overall, same trident-like leaves as sagebrush, but they're darker green and they are odorless on these shrubs. And this is usually a major component in mule deer diets where it exists. The last one I'm going to talk about today is Utah Service Berry. I don't have a lot of experience in general, specifically with myself identifying this plant. I haven't hunted a ton of areas where it's a large component of their diet. The only part of the Great Basin that seems to have it is Southeast Great Basin, and I'm not super familiar with that area. But um seems to be a common browse component in western Colorado and eastern Utah. But this is going to be within the same family as the other service berries. Well, the same group as the other service berries, but it also falls within that rose family. And on the USDA plants website, it's rated as palatable browse animal high. So it's within that same high rating for a browsing animal, browsing animal being goats and mule deer. This is going to be up to a 15 foot tree shrub sort of thing with leaves up to 2.5 inches. The distinct feature on this, the, the leaves on this is that, that all the serrations are going to be forward facing. And they're going to kind of start halfway up on that leaf, and they're all going to point sharply forward until at the front of the leaf you have kind of a flatter section where all the serrations are still pointing sharply forward. That's going to distinguish it from other things like choke cherry, where it's very finely serrated, and it's serrated along the entire edge, and they're longer leaves. But all your service berries are pretty much going to have this kind of oblong, but mainly rounded leaf shape with the serrations along, along the front edge and they're all facing forward. And they're pretty large serrations too. These aren't small serrations. They're pretty easy to see. All right, so I think that's going to wrap it up for most of the most of the browse species that I wanted to talk about today. Again, sagebrush is a major component of their diet, at least according to the studies that cover this region. I just want to cover the specifics of sagebrush in a different episode where I'm looking at different types and strains of sagebrush. But those three species that I talked about today, the antelope bitterbrush, the Utah service berry, and the mount mahogany, along with sagebrush, were going to be the major components of mule deer diet during that fall hunting period in this specific area. The sources that I'm going to keep using for this, and if you guys want to look at them, you can. This is all open source stuff, but USDA plants database, you can search it by species. I think you got to search it by scientific name, so you got to do a little homework there, but then it'll tell you a lot of identification characteristics, its growth habit, and then it'll give you plant ID pictures along with if it's a palatable species for browsing animals. The other website that I use to kind of get information on the overall ecological areas is the NRCS ecological site descriptions. I think those are mainly accessed through the Hornada Institute. That's the Hornada Experimental Range down in New Mexico. But if you searched Hornada 
and then NRCS ecological site descriptions, that would take you to a website where then it's got a map series and then you click on the map series and then you're able to specific assert, pick a specific site within that map area and then it'll give you a site description of how the vegetation interacts within that area under grazing pressure and browsing pressure and what species are featured as major components of that ecosystem. The other three sources I have on there are the specific articles that I used. Those are open source as well. I just searched them on Google Scholar and I didn't have any kind of university connections to get through those. But those are all open sourced and those will give you information on the specific studies that they did on the mule deer diets, whether it was fecal analysis or any kind of stomach content studies. So those are the specific sources I used. Next week I'm going to try and do one of these and I'm going to switch towards doing an area that I know better and I've specifically hunted. I'm going to do the central Nebraska Sandhills and then after that I'm going to do another one like this, an area that I haven't hunted but I have an understanding of the vegetation on. And then after that I'm probably going to hit up the Great Basin. But um, I'm going to try and do one of these every week so stay tuned for future episodes of this nature. Thanks for tuning in.